All right, today we are here with Felix Hartman of Hartman Capital. Felix is one of the bright minds in the crypto space, been in it a long time, is also a hedge fund crypto asset manager. Uh, Felix, thank you for being here today. Thanks so much for having me, Greg. Excited yeah. to do this. Absolutely. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself real quick and uh, Hartman Capital, who you guys serve and what you do? Yeah, so I've been a trader since 2012, 2013. And to keep things short, you know, I fell down the crypto rabbit hole by, you know, I was a startup CEO that used Bitcoin, you know, as a technology. And that let, let me down the crypto rabbit hole where very quickly I was looking more and more into it and realized, you know what, this is more initially, I, like most people, I disregarded it as an investment because I thought, you know, a currency isn't supposed to be worth more. Um, you know, why, like, why, why would it, this, this digital money accrue in value? Um, the more I looked into the, like for crypto Bitcoin specifically, it was a scarcity. We know once I realized, wait, there's only 21 million Bitcoin that will ever be around. And when you, once you look at, you know, uh, the, the size of the population, or even like funny numbers, like if every million in the world wants to own Bitcoin, they all could only have about 0.5 Bitcoin, right? Because there's 21 million Bitcoin and there's, I think, 35 million millionaires. So anyway, uh, that led me down the crypto rabbit hole. And this was then, you know, early, early 2017. Um, I decided to become a full-time crypto trader, um, you know, quit the startup, did really well for myself. That ultimately led me down um, that a lot of people were telling me, hey, why don't you trade for me? Why don't you invest for me? And that led me to starting the hedge fund. So this is now early 2018 when I started Hartman Digital Assets. And back then we were one of the first 100 crypto funds, period, you know, um, Funny enough, later that year, there was over a thousand. And then by the end of that year, I think there was maybe 30 left uh, because almost everybody shut their doors at the end of 2018, which I think showed us that a lot of the people in the space in that year were opportunists. They were just there for the quick money. They thought, you know, uh, let me ride the ship as long as it goes and then chop off. Whereas the few of us that were left really believed in this technology, even when Bitcoin was down to 3000, even when Ethereum was down to $80. And ever then, since then, it's been a building process. You know, we are uh, by now, my, my firm, as you asked, you know, we, we represent family offices. We represent at, these, at this stage, uh, even pu some publicly traded companies, um, some, you know, high, a lot of them are high, high net with ultra high net with individuals. And slowly, you know, we're creeping into the more institutional space where we're talking with endowment funds and so forth, which not just shows the maturity of the firm, but also the maturity of the space. Because I always say we are a microcosm, the macrocosm. So when I see a lot of inflows, that means there's a lot of other crypto funds out there with big inflows. And that just shows the the appetite and also the awareness that is around now. Because when I, you know, Two years ago, um, you could pretty much only raise money from high net with individuals because they had the least amount of bureaucracy, right? An individual says, I like this, I'm going to invest. Whereas when you talk with um, endowment funds or pension funds and so forth, there's a lot more red tape. There's boardrooms it has to go through. There's mandates where they say, hey, we do not touch crypto assets. Well, that's changed a lot now. So um, yeah, and then this is where we are now, you know, for, firm has about, you know, we're a team of six uh, growing into 10 next month. Um, so yeah, it's been an exciting few years. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. And uh, I saw you on Anthony Pompliano's podcast. And for everybody watching, uh, go check that out. I'll put a link to it in the description below. You can get more in-depth information on Felix's background. And you talk a lot about the metaverse and uh, DeFi, which we're going to get into here in a little bit. Um, so very in-depth podcast lot more information. We're going to keep this one short today because I know you're busy, especially with what's been going on. But mm -hmm. let's take a look at Bitcoin real quick and uh, spend a few minutes on that. We've seen some very interesting price action today, especially around the B word conference with Dorsey and Elon Musk and Kathy Wood. Uh, so uh, very specific price action, you know, all day today leading up to that. So why don't you take us through that a little bit and just kind of tell us what you see. Yeah, 100%. Let me go ahead and share my screen really quick. Let me see if I can. Uh, portion of the screen that's probably better. Yeah, and while you're pulling that up for everybody watching, we're going to get into DeFi discussion, which uh, I think we both agree is probably the uh, biggest opportunity for crypto um, here in the near future. There we go. Just there. Perfect. Okay. Oh, I'm sharing already, right? Can you see? Yep, it? we got perfect. it. Awesome. Yeah. So you can see here Bitcoin. You know, just using regular trading view chart for now. Um, the past few months, of course, have been quite muted, right? Um, I'm sure your audience is familiar with at least, you know, charts, the basics, right? So we, we had the big drawdown in early May, right? Until then we were topping out um, 
we, we still made higher highs, higher highs, but when the first higher, lower high came in was right around the beginning of May, end of April. Then with the big breakdown, and since then it's been rather muted, right? We've been had, having the same price action, the same price channel since May 19th right here. Um, you know, Bitcoin has been trading and perhaps most of its price action happened within a 25% range, which is really small for Bitcoin. Traditionally, you know, Bitcoin has, you know, an even larger average range, um, sometimes single day candles, like over here, for example, likely covered as much crown as the last two months have combined, right? What I found interesting, unlike last time, so right off the bat, I'll say like fundamentally, I'm ultra bullish, right? Fundamentally, um, for any sector you look at, you have with Bitcoin, for example, the amount, the, the wallets, um, let me see if I can pull this up. Uh, real quick class node. Um, there we go. Hall waves. Um, you know, this is something really interesting about fundamental analysis on Bitcoin. And I'll jump back into the price charts in a second. Let's see if I'm logged in. I'm logged in. It's just loading. There we go. So this is something really interesting that you don't have the stocks, for example. This shows you how long is the average Bitcoin being held, right? And the band, the colored bands, purple, is means over 10 years, this over seven years, over five years, over three years, over two years. And what you'll notice is that until any, any coin older than two years or more, um, that is expanding more and more. There's really never been a time except for a very brief period where a larger percentage of Bitcoins have been held for more than two years. At this point, that makes up almost 50% of the entire supply has been held for over two years. That's very different to other tops because when you look at the top right here, for example, you'll notice long-term holders are selling off the Bitcoin, right? The amount of coins being held for these long periods is contracting. And the amount of short-term holders in the darker colors, the red colors, is expanding. Because you know, as we go close to a to real top, long-term holders sell off, speculators buy in. And that's a problem because when most of the supply, like at a peak, is in the hands of speculators, they're just as quick to sell as they are to buy, right? We don't see that right now. We just don't see that. So fundamentally, I'm bullish uh, on, on Bitcoin. Fundamentally, on DeFi, you, know, you, you go to DeFi polls, right? And you'll notice that if you go to all-time chart, right, uh, we're still... The amount of money in DeFi is still $57 billion, which we literally broke. That was an all-time high in April. So things are very, very strong from fundamentally. But you know, when we look at the charts, the thing that has made me concerned, at least for the short term, is the fact that we continuously make lower lows, lower lows. And even here, we made another lower low. And the, the general trend is downwards, right? Um, the, the, the problem with some of these on-chain metrics is that it only tracks on-chain. That means whatever happens on Coinbase, or whatever, like for example, Coinbase custody is not tracked there. So could this be that some institutions are selling off? Maybe. The, the bottom line is that there has been a continuous downward pressure. And the thing to really look out for, or that made me um, take some downside protection, is the fact that we broke 30,000 finally, right? For the longest time, 30,000 served as you know, support. That's where the wick stopped almost every single time. That's where the body stopped. And we just broke it. And while we had great news today, before the call, we talked about the B word conference. Elon Musk saying even SpaceX holds Bitcoin. Uh, you know, um, Jack Dorsey saying he is launching, he wants to launch DeFi on Bitcoin. And we'll talk about that more in a second. Um, it's, it's a rather underwhelming push. And what you'll notice is that we continue to be suppressed by the 20 daily moving average. So for me, you know, until those levels are broken, right? It, it's going to be an uphill battle. It's going to be an uphill battle. And again, long term, I'm, I'm very, very bullish based on the actual underlying fundamentals because you know there's more money than ever using DeFi. There, the metaverse, these decentralized games are more make, making more money than ever. Um, like X Infinity made eighty million dollars this week. This week, $80 million. So it's incredible the things that are happening in DeFi, in Metaverse, on Ethereum, and even Bitcoin's own adoption with El Salvador, et cetera. Um, but it, th th there might still be more um, speculator washout happening. I think we're getting close to the bottom. You can tell that by the, by this, the tiny amount that is still being held by short-term holders, right? Um, this orange band, for example, which is uh, one week to one month, 
is nearing its, its lowest point ever. I mean, you can look to the left as a thin gray line that highlights it. There's almost never been fewer people by percent of Bitcoin holdings that have been in this for less than a month. So the amount of speculators, I think, is getting washed out and we're getting very close to it. But I'm not completely counting out the possibility of, you know, us retesting the 20,000 all-time high. But as a full disclaimer, I'm 100% long. I'm 100% long, um, both personally and with the fund. However, uh, we're using downside protection right now, like puts on, on Bitcoin in case that happens. Um, because even then, I think the math has to, be, has to be made where you say, well, what is the worst case? Like, you know, let's say this happens. The downside is 37%. However, if we go, if we proceed further, right? Most people targeted, for example, $200,000 per Bitcoin for the cycle. Well, that's a, that's a 500% gain. That, that's, a, that's a good risk reward. And the risk reward only looks better when you look at most of DeFi, where you maybe have another 30% to go on the downside, but the upside is 10, 20, 30, 50 X, at which point then the question is, you know, does it really matter whether you enter 10% lower, 20% lower, or, you know, kind of like bite the bullet now and get yourself an allocation? That makes a lot of sense. Now, what do you think realistically we could see by the end of the year if if we had a reversal? You mean reversal to the upside? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I I still very much like 2018. 2018, it's, it's still on the Hartman Capital website. I made an, uh, a cycle analysis where I, let me see if I can actually pull this up real quick. Hartman Cap, uh, I got to pull up the right one here. .com. Um, I made a uh, cycle analysis uh, right here where, funny enough, I, I looked at all the prior cycles, right? The Bitcoin launch cycle, the first halving, the second halving, the third halving. And ironically, you know, this is exactly where we were. In, in May 20, 2020, we were right about $10,000, right about, you know, there. Uh, my target, that, that's a long target range, right? 233%. But at the very bottom, you know, I pretty much give my numbers. So I said, but at the halving, you know, May 17th, we're going to be somewhere between 7,800 to 15,500, right? In actuality, uh, May 17th, you know, we were right about 9,500, $10,000. So right, right in that range. And of course, this was written somewhere over here. So, I mean, anything could have happened. And most people would probably not have guessed that we would be pretty much where we were uh, two years later. Um, for market top, you know, I thought December 30, like end of this year, we'd be somewhere between 150 to $500,000. That's a large range, but regardless, it's significantly higher than where we are now. Even the lower bounce uh, would be a 5X from where we are now. Uh, my expectation is that we are going to be somewhere close to $200,000. Um, uh, following price peak would be about $200,000. That's my expectation. And I still very much think that's possible. Uh, you know, what would that look like? Um, the years over here, well, that would be steep. That would be steep at that point, at this point. Uh, you know, at a quarter, at a quarter, you know, I, I very much think something like this is possible, which is why I am, you know, very long right now. Um, it reminds me a lot, and I'll show you this real fast. And I've said this even already in, in February when things were still looking pretty. It reminded me, this cycle reminded me a lot of 2013, where you had a two cycle, a, a, like kind of like a two micro cycle, two micro cycles within one bigger one, right? You can see this right here. At first glance, this looks harmless, right? This looks harmless at first glance. In reality, it was a 75% pullback, right? So you had, you know, from bottom to peak, you raised, rallied 12,000%. You quickly corrected 75%. And then you had another rally that went up 1,700%. Okay. So second one was, of course, much smaller. But the interesting thing is that this was only about, you know, a 100-day cooldown. In 100 days, it shed 75% of its value and then went on to the next run. And why did I think already February that this could be possible? Well, when you look at the, just the, the steepness of it, right? It was extremely steep going into this run. Um, and it obviously couldn't have continued at the pace we were going because if we continued at the pace we were going, 
we would have already hit 200,000, you know, in March, in April. So the, the, a cool down was obviously needed and we had it now. So I think it's very possible that maybe not, not December anymore, but I, I, I think certainly by the end of Q2 of next year, you will have triple digit, meaning six digit uh, Bitcoin. That's, that, that's roughly what I'm looking at. And, and unlike prior market tops, you know, uh, these are blow of tops. These are very clean blow of tops with a parabola breaks. Here, it was not a blow of top. Um, but rather, you know, you have this rounded kind of top. And these are much more common in, in the middle of a bull run than at the end of one, right? At the end of one, you usually have so much fervor, so much, you know, retail participation where you know, it's, 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 it combusts, you know, a bubble burst is when there's so much buying pressure and then like in a very short time, uh, it evaporates. Here, we had like a, a, at least a 30-day top, right? This was, oh no, this was 90 days. This was 84 days of top. That that's not that's usually not a full market top. That's usually more in the middle of a cycle. So, do you feel like we need more contraction? We need to get a little deeper uh, on the downside before we can see that parabolic move to the upside. I look. I I don't think the market never needs to to do anything. Um, you know, the market will do what the market will do. Of course, certainly when you have rallied this much, correction is good and correction is healthy. That did the job, right? That should, that should have done the job that wiped out most of the leverage in the system, right? It, may, it taught a lot of people an important lesson not to use, you know, 10x, 20x, 30x leverage. So that's out of the system now. Um, in terms of needing a correction, I think that's already done. Now it's just a question, are people ready to return, right? Or are people, again, you know, I, I think what happened this time around is, and, and this is partially anecdotal, partially just also data-driven. Um, a lot of people are trying to front run the top where there's so many people that were burned in 2017 that said, I wish I sold the top. So the second the market start correcting, like, oh, this time I'm not going to be the one left holding the bag. Even though the fundamentals are vastly different where you've publicly traded companies holding on the balance sheet, you've countries having Bitcoin as legal tender and so much more. Um, now the question is, you know, is there in a, like at what point do the seller, sellers run out? And more importantly, I'd say return of big buyers. You know, people have used the, the language before, you know, uh, the return when the cavalry comes, you know, when you have big funds, maybe some big names, institutional names, um, making a significant move and kind of like, you know, putting the stake in the ground saying, you know what, we're, uh, we build a Bitcoin position, kind of like pretty much what MicroStrategy did, right? MicroStrategy kind of ignited this run back in September here. So I think it will take something like that, some big catalyst, and you will have a smooth, clean um, next wave up. If not, it's going to build what I call a, a tail, you know, um, like you had over here, you know, it slowly forms a tail here, it slowly forms a tail and then until the catalyst is ready. So that's possible, right? That if there's no big news, if there's no, um, you know, large buyer that enters the phase, it's going to be continuous uh, rebalancing of sellers and buyers until there's more buyers, at which point we'll be ready for the next run. Um, but I personally don't, um, you know, again, I, we are very heavily focused on DeFi, uh, perhaps 70% of the fund is DeFi, and we barely trade Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin is more uh, the leading indicator for the market. It's, it's, it's where you park your money. It's like, it's like gold, you know, is gold the best investment at all periods of time? No, gold is usually a, a place where you want to park your money when things get overheated. And the same thing rings true in the crypto market because when the market goes up, generally uh, other digital assets outperform Bitcoin like DeFi. And when the market goes down, Bitcoin tends to be the smallest loser, right? While it seems rough that Bitcoin lost, you know, let's say, uh, you know, 40, 50% of its value, you go to other tokens, let's say Rune, for example, you know, Rune. Uh, lost around 80, 85% of its value, right? So you, when crypto goes risk off, you either want to be in stables or Bitcoin because a lot of people that will not hold stables, they rather go into something like Bitcoin. Um, so I think right now it makes more sense to position oneself in you know value accruing DeFi because the benefit if it's value accruing and when I say, what I mean by value accruing is that they actually make network revenues is that your position can actually fundamentally grow um, while you wait, right? So let's say you you wait you have to wait for 180 days um, while the market forms a tail, right? Um, or or waits for catalyst, so to say. 
Well, a lot of these networks, um, they're still making money. And the way that that plays out is that um, earnings are usually paid out in one of two ways, right? Which is number one, uh, staking, right? So staking is like a dividend, right? I stake my tokens, I own a dividend. Well, great. Um, several of the tokens that I hold, you know, pay me something between a 30 to uh, sometimes 80% uh, staking uh, reward, right? Sometimes based on the earnings, sometimes based on um, what's it called, uh, inflation. Um, but, the, but the inflation is counteracted by the fact that the, the st- not everybody in network stakes. So if in a network, for example, 20% stake and 100% of the inflation goes towards those stakers, I still increase my ownership of the network, right? Um, and secondly, buy and burn mechanisms. Um, that, that's something that, for example, Maker does. So the more, uh, the more money network makes, the more tokens it buys and burns, which means supply reduction, right? Either way, with either one and two, my percent ownership of the network goes up. So if it takes a while, I am okay with it because I have a long, ter- long time horizon. Um, and ultimately, when they do come back, I just own more of the network. Yeah, and I think that's the big eye opener for the institutional investors out there. You know, the big question, what do you do with cash, right? So we have, we have issues and uncertainty in the markets. The bond markets are, you know, yields are falling off a cliff. Yeah. Everybody's looking for yields, but very few people have woken up to the DeFi space and what's possible there. A hundred percent. I mean, it's it's a world star for yield right now, especially when yield is below inflation. I mean, that's that's a whole different. You know, if if just yields were low, that's one thing. But now, you know, you've got to compete with what like five point five percent inflation. Uh, the numbers have been varying, but that's one of the latest numbers. And if you have to make a base five point five percent before you see any money, that cuts out so many asset classes. I mean, there's really only like at that point you even. You can forget about muni bonds, you know, um, or even some like, you know, corporate debt. Um, what you have now left, you know, is equities. Um, I mean, most real estate, you, you're the more the expert on real estate, but, you know, a lot of, a lot of times cap rate is what, like 6%. Uh, it might've gone up during COVID, but even that um, presents challenges for at the very least from a portfolio construction perspective. It ha- makes cap sense. rates are half that where you're sitting right now, that building yeah. that you're in is probably a three cap. Wow. So, so that too, then, is a challenge where you, it, it doesn't mean that you have to throw out the entire asset class if it performs below inflation. But what it does mean is that it makes sense to add higher risk instruments to one's portfolio to increase the net performance, right? So that's something that's interesting with, with crypto assets. And we actually wrote about this uh, in, in one of our latest blogs where we discussed, you know, whether or not crypto assets are too volatile. Volatility can be a feature rather than a bug because, you know, you can... You can't expect to have, let's say, 100% upside, but then only a 2% downside, right? That, that's not how it works. But the interesting thing is, is, is let's say, for example, we did this uh, in, in the last blog. We said, okay, over five-year period, you have the 10% chance uh, to 10x your position. You have a 10% chance to 5x your position. And you have an 80% chance to go to zero, right? Um if you were to allocate 10% or let's say 5% of your portfolio, right? The rest of your portfolio, the other 95% are invested traditionally with safe means where maybe you, you're making 5%, okay? So all you're really doing is you're risking one year of earnings from the other 95% to fund a higher risk one where you have a 10% chance of that 5% Growing, oh no, uh, actually, I think the, the number was 20, right? Um, you have a 5% ch- uh, you have a 10% chance of that 5% turning as large as your entire portfolio, doubling it, right? You have another, uh, sorry, that's a 10% chance. And then you have another 10% chance of that small 5% allocation, right? Uh, growing your entire portfolio by another 25%, right? And it's entirely financed by the underlying growth. So um, when, when you look at those numbers, it, it actually starts making a lot of sense having small but target allocations. And by the way, I, you know, I, I definitely do not think that that's the risk profile of crypto. I think that's just a very, the most 
extremely aggressively conservative way to present this data. You know, the, the data might look a lot more like, you know, there's a 10% chance of perhaps, let's say, a 50x. There is a 10% chance, you know, uh, or actually there's a, you know, let's say a 30% chance of a 10x. And then, you know, you, you've got smaller amounts and, and then maybe there's a 20% chance of going to zero. That's where I would put it. But, you know, for those that say, hey, crypto is so high risk, there's an 80% chance of going to zero. Let's assume that for a second. And actually an allocation makes sense. Um, you know, I, I was recently thinking myself of like, well, I'm, you know, I made a lot of money in this bull market and asked myself, well, you are, I, I personally am hundred percent crypto. Is there a way where I, I would diversify? Well, equities for me are kind of out of the question. Why? Because they have roughly the same downside. We saw this in COVID, a lot of tech stocks, a lot of like even indexes drop 50 to 70%. Well, in that case, if I have the same risk in the worst case, in the tail risk, I might as well hold crypto. Right, because the upside is vastly different. If I, you know, real estate for me personally is not liquid enough. I, I, I really prefer liquidity at this stage. Um, the, the only things that come to mind that could long-term outperform crypto, you know, are things like um, space, maybe genetic engineering. Um, you know, you, you really have to go to like frontier technologies there and they are only available as venture. They're not liquid like crypto. So Right, that's what I was going to say. Venture and equity capital would be the only two other spaces where you could get a 10 or a 20 X yep. you could get that, but it's not liquid. You're, you're locking up for five years. At least. Right. Cause like I, especially when you look at things like space, they have to go public, you know, which nowadays is easy with SPACs. Um, but then with SPACs, a lot of times you don't get the same returns as a proper IPO because they're kind of like, they're trying to go out as, as fast as possible. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I think, you know, digital assets at least deserve to be in every person's portfolio um, whether that's 1%, 5%, or, you know, we've, we've talked with other people, you know, some people allocate as high as, you know, 30, 50%. It's all a question of, you know, what's your, what's your net worth? What's your income? What's your risk tolerance? Um, you know, how, how badly do you need that money that you have to allocate? If you have a longer time horizon, it will serve you better because it, it's, it has to be made very clear that crypto is far from, you know, being risk-free. A lot of people invested in crypto over here thinking that, oh, you know, it's, it's going to go up anyway. And then they see the positions down 50, 60% and they don't know what to do. Well, if you have the long time horizon, that does not matter. It, 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 it really does matter when you look at the underlying and say, hey, um, they're making more. Let's see if I can pull up one more real quick. Um, I, I want to show you token terminal really quick because that just uh, goes to show um, some of the earnings this uh, space makes. There we go. So token terminal is, you know, uh, one of these emerging tech platforms that allows us, that allows you to see the actual earnings of the protocols in crypto, right? So this shows the last 30 days, for example, last 30 days, there's at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, let's say 13 protocols in crypto, like DeFi protocols, not Bitcoin, not Ethereum, but like things built on top of them that made over a million dollars in the last 30 days, right? In the last year, you know, their uh, Axie made over 100 million, uh, Pancake Swap made over 80 million, MakerDAO made over 60 million. And this is actual cash collected, not projection. This is actual cash that went in. So, you know, we're, we're way past this point where people used to say, uh, you know, crypto is not backed by anything. It's creative fool theory. There's nothing to it. No, the, these protocols are making millions of dollars, right? And now the irony is, is that some of them, you can, you can scroll down here and see, you know, the price to sales ratio or even the PE ratio. You've got PE ratios at 4, 10, 13, 14, 17, 28. That's something that even Warren Buffett or Ben Graham would like, right? But at the same time, these are hyper growth assets, right? So it's very rare. And even, even here, you know, 30, 40, 50 is still fine. It's very rare that you find... Uh, growth investments with the kind of value proposition of a value investment. So and, let's talk about this for a second. So yep. sushi swap. A lot of people are familiar with sushi swap. Yep. So let's let's talk about how do they earn their uh, revenues. Yep. So sushi swap is you know it's an, the second biggest decentralized exchange in the market. Um, and what sushi swap does, unlike Uniswap, is that anytime you make a trade, right? Every, let's say you trade. Let's say you trade $1,000 of Bitcoin for Ethereum, right? When you make the trade, you pay a 0.3% fee, okay? 0.3% of $1,000 is $3, right? 
Um, so those three dollars, um, five po five basis points of the thirty basis points, goes towards Sushi token holders. Okay. Let me see if I can switch. Uh, let me pull my my notes tool here. There we go. Let's just go back here. Right. So if if you spend if you make the thousand dollar trade, Sushi Swap gets three dollars off those three dollars. Five sixth go go to the liquidity provider. The Which guy are the stakers, the people that are staking? Well, the you know, no, the people that are providing the actual liquidity. So like if you're trading uh, Bitcoin against ETH, right? There's people, the liquidity providers, they provide Bitcoin and ETH. And if you sell, if you sell Bitcoin, then they'll take the Bitcoin and give you ETH. If you sell Ethereum, they'll give you Bitcoin and take your ETH, right? Um, the other sixth, one sixth, goes, goes, to the sushi uh, stakers, right? So you have to be a sushi token holder and you stake those sushi tokens, right? And what that turns out is that, you know, you can, we can go back to, uh, well, off the $3, you know, um, well, that's easy, it's 50 cents, right? So 50 cents off your $3 go to the sushi stakers. Um, that is a very interesting at scale because, you know, we can go to, it might be under markets, exchanges, there we go. You go to exchanges and you can see, you know, over the last 180 days, you know, sushi swap, is sushi on here. Why is sushi? Oh, there we go. Yeah. You know, sushi does something like $2 billion a day, $2 billion in volume a day. So of course, all of a sudden, Hey, it actually makes a lot of sense um, that, you know, th five basis points of billions of dollars that gets quite interesting. And you can even look here. Um, Let's see, can, can I see profits maybe? Uh, no, but I guess, yeah. What, what we can do is revenue, revenue and divided by six, roughly, right? So let's put in here add project and we find sushi swap, right? And you can see sushi is dominating in the, all the other ones in terms of how much money they're making. We can take all these out, right? And you'll see that, you know, sushi makes, you know, half a million dollars, even now when markets are really muted right over here it, on this day it on may 19th it made 10 million dollars in a single day right and again one sixth of that goes to token holders which means on that day you know almost almost two million dollars went to token holders in a single day two million dollars so these um, are real companies with real revenues a hundred percent real companies with, with real revenues with real uh, profits that you can get a, get, get a portion of Right. And if here, you know, like for Q1, Q2, I would say the average daily income, if we were to draw a line, you know, it's maybe $1.5 million, $1.5 million in revenue a day for something that maybe has, I would say, no more than 10 to 12 team members. That's all code, right? Where um, they have no cost of goods because the liquidity isn't provided by them. It's provided by the liquidity providers. Remember, that's, that's who gets the other five, six. So, um, and that's fascinating, especially when you think about the fact that Sushi Swap was um, a fork, meaning copy of Uniswap, that was more decentralized, right? And and what's just as important is that now, well, people can say, well, if you can just copy the code, how will they be able to sustain it? Well, by now there's probably a thousand different copies of Uniswap, other AMMs. What matters is well, brand is one, you know, trust is one. Um, more and more features, you know, you, you, while, while many have stuck with just being a, uh, an exchange, SushiSwap now has lending, SushiSwap has yield aggregation, it's got a launch pad, uh, it's adding, uh, it, 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 the way it attracts a lot of liquidity too is that they have incentive models where they say, hey, um, why don't we go off the detail uh, of assets? You know, there's all, every exchange is already having Bitcoin and Ethereum. Let's go off the tokens that are not listed anywhere else. So they might say, hey, uh, so one of our portfolio companies, for example, uh, Rari, RGT, um, they uh, only had very limited liquidity. So they, they have something called the onsen menu where they find mid-market cap projects, let's say anywhere from $20 million to $200 million in market cap, right? And they create incentives where they say, hey, we will pay you in sushi tokens if you provide liquidity for these symbols. And now all of a sudden, anytime anybody trades most of the mid-cap projects, they usually have to go through sushi swap because that's where the best liquidity is and best and and that's how aggregators work too is that 
the aggregator, like one inch pulls liquidity from the best places. And so by default, many, many times, they almost always drop from sushi swap, which brings them these kind of revenues and these kind of volumes. Let's see, trading volume, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, trading volumes, that's something else I think is important to realize is that while we see a slowdown in trading volume on decentralized exchanges compared to peak in May, we are leagues above where we were in December, right? I mean, you can, you can, you can see even, let's say at the end of 2021, right? December 31st, where's December 31st? You know, December 31st, Uniswap did half a billion in volume. Sushi Swap. I can't, I can't see because it's, it's hiding uh, behind my, there we go, let's see. Uh, Sushi Swap did, where's Sushi hiding? 180 million, right? Now, after the crash, when everything is super, you know, slowed down, uh, Uni is making over 800 million. You have multiple new exchanges being added, like Perpetual Protocol and so forth. Um, it's just, you know, it's certainly here to stay. And it's only going to be more, I think, represented as more assets are being added because now with something like synthetics, for example, you have synthetic stocks. You have, so on the trading side, you can, you can trade synthetic stocks, you can trade synthetic gold, synthetic oil, synthetic index funds, and so forth. So now we can already trade any asset in the world on decentralized exchanges. And then in terms of lending protocols, there's something really interesting happening with, for example, um, MakerDAO. MakerDAO has a partnership with a platform called Centrifuge, where now you can get decentralized loans that are collateralized with things like bonds, real estate, and so many other traditional assets. And, and when that clicks, you know, it's no more just this crypto to, to crypto game, but rather DeFi is really replacing all the finance and making itself composable with all the other traditional asset classes that have been out there. Yeah, it's, it's exciting times. And I think this is the real opportunity in this space moving forward. And we're just scratching the surface. Um, we haven't even really talked about the applications in physical real estate, uh, you know, and how that can be um, tokenized and, you know, how DeFi could impact the real estate market. Mm -hmm. That's a 36 trillion, just the housing market in this country is 36 trillion. Oh, yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, like what, what I imagine is that any asset in the world will be tokenized. Right. So, and then the tokenization means that it's still, of course, in the real world, you have your physical real estate, but you also have uh, an non-fungible token, for example, in case of real estate, because, you know, the difference really quickly between non-fungible tokens and fungible tokens, as the name suggests, is that, you know, any fungible token, any ERC-20 is the same, right? And Ethereum is an Ethereum is an Ethereum. But with a non-fungible token, let's say, for example, a token of a house, not every house is created equally. Right, every house, the location is different, the size is different, the uh, you know, uh, the plumbing is different, looks at everything is different, right? So each house will be likely represented as a non fungible token. However, um, there will be registries online where that non fungible token is valued by maybe third party assessors or by decentralized assessors, who knows, right? And there will be an at least an assessed value, maybe not a market value, but not based on buyers and sellers, because if you're holding, there's no buyers or sellers, but there's an assessed value. And based on that assessed value, perhaps you can use that token, that house token as collateral to get a loan from Avio Compound, just like a HELOC, except it's not going to take, you know, uh, months and months of paperwork, but rather a few seconds on, you know, because it's all done comp computationally. And you don't have to find one specific lender that's willing to lend against that, but rather, uh, I know it's entire pools that are spe specifically made for lending against, um, you know, ha tokenized uh, house, to uh, house tokens, so to say. Hard assets, yeah, houses, that, cars, whatever. Houses, cars, base, built based on specific assessment criteria or oracles, right? Price oracles. Um, and, and that really, when, when, when that clicks, when you realize, well, in the future, my art will be tokenized. My house will be tokenized. Heck, maybe even my car will be tokenized, but it's a depreciating token, who knows? Uh, like. Any asset that you have, your cash will not be sitting in your bank anymore, but it will be probably earning some money either on, you know, Wi-Fi or Aave or Compound. Your, 
Um, what else do we have? Your stocks will likely not be sitting in E-Trade, but rather either be on synthetics or they will be in Mirror or some other synthetic asset protocol. Um, because the cool thing with, uh, with synthetic stocks, for example, is that not only do they trade 24 seven, right? The stock market closes, well, Mirror never closes, but they also list sooner. So there's been many times when stocks were literally trading on Mirror or synthetics before they IPO. Why? Because what's the stock price? It's whatever somebody's willing to pay for it. It's buyers and sellers. So like Robinhood, for example, I, I, I might be, I don't know if Robin IPO'd already, but uh, I think Robinhood is about to IPO and Robinhood is already tradable on some synthetic asset protocols, you know? And th that's, th that's just cool to me when all of a sudden all your assets are in one place and you can make them capital efficient on your own, right? If you say, hey, I hold stocks in, in Tesla, but I want to earn some interest on them. Well, instead of E-Trade lending them out to hedge funds to short them, you can lend them out yourself to short pools and earn interest from the short sellers. You've got cash sitting around. Well, your, 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 your Marcus, Marcus by Goldman savings, high yield savings account pays you like 0.5% a year. You can make a, a very, fairly safe, um, you know, five to 30% using different DeFi protocols, right? 30%. Um, you have, you know, crypto tokens, obviously you can, you know, you can either stake them for network earnings, you can lend them out, you can provide liquidity. Any asset you have can be and honestly should be somehow capital efficient because the fact that it's not is your money sitting on itself, sitting around. Uh, Cause people say like, you, you should make money while you sleep. Well, your money should make money while you sleep. Right. If your money is not deployed, and that means even holding something passively, you're leaving money on the table. Because if you don't do it, traditionally the banks will do it, the exchanges will do it. Exchanges will lend out your stock to short sellers. Um, banks will lend out your 0.5% interest savings account to someone else's 25% credit card. And that's, I think, the most powerful killer app that DeFi brings to the table is bringing capital efficiency and control over your own money back to users where they can make. 20 to 30% extra a year just by owning the capital efficiency. And 20 to 30% is, is, is mind numbing returns uh, when you apply that to any asset. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're not getting that anywhere else. You're, I mean, real estate, you have to develop real estate or, or do heavy lift value add. Your traditional real estate projects aren't going to generate those kind of returns. Almost nothing does. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about DeFi on Bitcoin. Okay. Yeah. So, so DeFi on Bitcoin has been a topic that's been coming up a little bit more. Um, you know, two big proponents of that are, uh, you know, one, Anthony Pompliano, you know, he's, he's investor in Sovereign. Uh, we talked about that at the very end of our podcast. And then Jack Dorsey. Jack Dorsey wants to build DeFi on Bitcoin as well. He's, he just funded a new company that is going to build that. I have several issues with DeFi on Bitcoin, and I'll explain, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm a fairly open-minded guy. You know, I hold Bitcoin. I hold Ethereum. I explore other layer one blockchains like, um, you know, I, I think Luna, like Terra is interesting. I think Solana is interesting. I also think that a lot of other layer ones are absolute, um, yeah, I don't know what the language restrictions are on this channel, but, you know, they're, they're, they're not good. They're not good at all. Um, yeah, we're family friendly. Thank you. <laughs> family friendly. So I know, I know I'm controlling myself. That was good. That was good. Yeah. So um, in terms of uh, Bitcoin on DeFi, uh, I'm sorry, DeFi on Bitcoin, there's a few issues. First of all, the most blatant one is that right now it is fairly impossible to actually build directly on Bitcoin, right? Uh, Bitcoin it, that is not, is not Turing complete, right? So what that means is that you can't actually build complex programs directly on Bitcoin, right? So sometimes people sneak in and say like, oh, this is DeFi built on Bitcoin. No, actually it's not, right? What they have is they have side chains, right? Uh, like RSK, for example, right? So RSK uh, is a side chain to Bitcoin that's, that's building on top of Bitcoin, but when you build DeFi, so when you build DeFi on RSK, um, you're not actually building on Bitcoin. So you, you, you're not completely secured by the security that Bitcoin has. And if you're not secured by Bitcoin, then you might as well build on Ethereum. Why build on RSK when you might as well build on Ethereum? That doesn't make sense, right? Um, are they trying to build out 
um, you know, the, the programmability of Bitcoin. Yes, the problem is Bitcoin, uh, and this is a problem and a feature. Think about Bitcoin a little bit like the US Constitution, right? The US Constitution changes slowly. It's a living, breathing document that can be updated, but it is updated e extremely infrequently with a lot of thought and a lot of possibility of like changes getting blocked, right? Why is that? Well, because you want to have something that is like breaking proof, right? You want something that doesn't just easily break. You don't, you don't want short-term sentiments to lead to bad decisions, right? If something changes in the US constitution or in Bitcoin, it's been thought about a lot. It's been debated a lot. And the vast majority of all participants are on the same page, right? So as a, as a result, uh, Bitcoin is extremely anti-fragile, right? And also Bitcoin is extremely predictable, right? You, you, for example, most people, even those that don't like Bitcoin will agree with you, will, will, will agree with the statement that Bitcoin is likely not going to ever increase its supply from 20 million to anything higher, right? With any other asset, Ethereum included, there will be discussions and they say, hey, it actually could be like, you know, e economically incentively better to, you know, uh, have higher inflation, lower inflation, like things on Ethereum have always changed. So the, the, the benefit for Bitcoin in this case is that slow to change, but also resilient. Ethereum, on the other hand, is fast, fast to change, but has had a fair, a fair, Jesus Christ, a fair share of pickups, right? From having to fork Ethereum from ETC to ETH, to you know many smart contract, uh, many smart contracts on Ethereum get exploited because of like pro programmatic errors. But it's uh, something uh, Vitalik, the founder of Ethereum, said that makes a lot of sense. Is that and he said this as a critique to Cardano. Cardano is trying to be um, peer reviewed. You know, a lot of papers on a lot of research on. It. He said like the things that will ultimately break your platform are likely the things that you don't think of. So a lot of times it's better to release product and let the market try and break it. And if the market breaks it, then you can fix it. But you, you're much faster to find out the flaws and the weaknesses on live mainnet than you are trying to guess and trying to decipher what could possibly go wrong, right? But to bring it back to DeFi and Bitcoin, so number one, um, any of the DeFi that is being built on Bitcoin right now is literally not built on Bitcoin. It is built on a side chain to Bitcoin. So it lacks security of Bitcoin. Number two, what are some of the, uh, let, what are some of the uh, slogans, let's call them, that Bitcoiners believe in, right? Well, number one, um, not your keys, not your Bitcoin. Okay, so I'm not sure if all the Bitcoin, like, Who's the, who's the addressable market for DeFi and Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoiners. Would Bitcoiners really put the Bitcoin into a smart contract? Not so sure, because again, they lose the access to the keys. So doesn't seem like something a Bitcoiner would do. What else do Bitcoiners believe in? HODL, okay? Well, in order for you to provide liquidity to decentralized exchange, you're not HODLing. You're suffering something called impermanent loss, right? Because you're trading against others. So would Bitcoiners put the Bitcoin into, you know, uh, into a pool? I don't think so, right? And then the, then the next question is, who like, who builds it? Who builds all this DeFi, and how is it funded? Right? When we, we talked about stuff like Sushi Swap and how the token accrues value, and the team that the, the Sushi team has Sushi tokens, so they're getting incentivized for their labor by holding Sushi tokens, right? So they, they're more like companies, right? They're structured like companies. The problem is um, Bitcoiners, and because we're family friendly, there's this, this term that starts with an S uh, and ends with itcoin, right? So um, most Bitcoiners believe that anything that is not Bitcoin is an S coin, right? Um, so the question is, does DeFi on Bitcoin, will they not have their own tokens, right? And if they don't have their own tokens, how does it work? Because the problem is we've had that in the past. There was a, um, there was a platform called Open Bazaar, right? Open Bazaar was pretty much 
in, next to the Silk Road and even after the Silk Road, it was like a decentralized Amazon, if you want. It was a decentralized marketplace, right? And you think that a decentralized marketplace should be able to raise fortunes in this bull market, should be able to grow massively and build integrations and this and that and that. Well, here's the problem. Open Bursar functioned completely, non, no token, no equity. It was just a nonprofit, essentially. And guess what? They, they ran out of money and shut down. When did they shut down? Believe it or not, I think it was like about I would January 2021, meaning the hottest period in crypto, the oldest decentralized marketplace shut down. To me, that just highlights that it had poor incentive mechanisms. Right. And so if, if, if big the DeFi on Bitcoin goes down the same route of just community funded technologies, I just don't think they're going to be able to at least grow at the same pace as DeFi on Ethereum does. Because again, when you, the money makes the world go round and you have to incentivize everybody to do their job right. You incentivize the liquidity providers because otherwise, why would I provide liquidity? You got to incentivize the developers. Um, so you get not, not because they, they, they are only in for the money, but so you get the best developers, right? You got to incentivize, um, you know, the, the, anybody who partakes in the system, right? Whether it's lenders, whether it's, um, you know, all the different jobs that need to be done, done um, stakers for security, um, Oracle, you know, Oracle feed providers, right? The way Chainlink works is that uh, I can run an Oracle and I'm the one that's in charge of providing accurate data, but I have to stake Chainlink tokens. And if, if I lie about the data, my tokens get slashed. Again, you need this, this truth mechanism in this instance. So for us as, as allocators to digital assets, meaning all these tokens, every token serves a purpose and every token is meant to be um, the lifeblood to an incentive system that make that system go round. Uh, and if you take that away, I, I don't think most of the stuff would work. And I don't see Bitcoiners all of a sudden believing in anything that's not Bitcoin. Yeah. And, you know, Elon um, pointed out a lot of the technology limitations that you're talking about. He pointed out a little bit about um, the network, um, the social network, like you're talking about. And, you know, Dorsey kind of acknowledged that, that, that those are some issues. Uh, and it may very well be that they find out that, you know, what they're, the problem they're trying to solve may not be able to be solved that way. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. Now, let's talk about real quick before we wrap up one more question on the limitation of supply in Bitcoin, which is obviously the biggest feature of that project and that asset. And what is, is keeping the supply um, limited if down the road, you know, as we, we have the halvings, and the miners get to a point to where they realize, well, wait a minute, you know, we're not gonna be able to make any more money. And they get together and decide, well, let's increase the supply. I mean, what stops that from happening? Because it's not like it can't be increased. It's up to them, right? Yeah. Well, the idea behind the big, you know, the block reward is also called a subsidy, right? And the idea is that it's a, su a subsidy. Most subsidies are meant to be short term, right? So the Bitcoin block reward ends in about 2,140. Right in the year 2140, that's when the last Bitcoin is mined. Well, the idea is that by 2140, there is a large enough fee market that makes mining worth it. Right, that there's enough people using the Bitcoin network that pay transaction fees in it, where you don't, you no longer need to subsidize. Right, it, it, it's 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 really beautiful the way it's structured. That like, you know, every four years, every four years you have the halvings, and you slowly vean the, the system off of these subsidies it gets less and less and less and less. And it will happen when you simply look at Ethereum, for example. Um, I believe, if, if, if I'm not incorrect, um, that like in Q1, there was, there, there was several times in Q1 where the actual Ethereum network fees made up perhaps 85% of the entire block reward, right? So that means, uh, or like the, of, of the incentive, right? So while in the past it used to be... Um, you know, subsidy made up 90% and like fees are a tiny fraction. That's how most blockchains look like, by the way. If you look at anything that's not Bitcoin or Ethereum, it's almost entirely subsidy. But now when people start using a network, you know, the subsidy becomes a small and small and small percentage and real fees that the users pay start making up for it. 
And that's when that, that fixed supply, the, the Austrian economics can work out. But in order to get there, you need adoption, right? You need people using it, not just holding it because holding doesn't pay any fees. But if you think of, and this is where I see both Ethereum and Bitcoin, uh, and that's something that Bitcoiners have to get, you know, wrap their head around is that Bitcoin and Ethereum will likely both be settlement layers. They're not going to be transaction layers. It's, it would be too expensive to operate for everybody to operate on Ethereum and Bitcoin natively. Instead, what we're going to have is, you know, with Ethereum, we have, we're now looking at things like rollups um, where you have layer two solutions. So you have either layer two solutions or you have side chains. Side chains would be stuff like RSK or on Ethereum, we've got Polygon. The idea is that um, you do most of your transactions on the side chains or layer two, and then more important transactions or occasionally over long periods of time, you settle them on the base chain, you know, like, like Ethereum, like Bitcoin layer one. The reason for that is that you have security, better security layer one, but also higher cost. The, the visual that I compare this to sometimes is a store, right? Does a store run to the bank vault every single time a customer comes and needs change? No, you, you have a register, right? Is the register faster? Yes, but when somebody walks in with a gun, can they steal the register? Sure, right? So there's less security, but more speed. And then you've got the base, the settlement layer, the vault, which is high security, but it's kind of slow and inefficient, right? And, and that, that also addresses the concerns about a costs of Bitcoin layer one and the speed of Bitcoin layer one, because people say, oh, it takes, you know, 10 minutes per block, 60 minutes for confirmation. Um, is it, you know, it, it will never work. Well, I don't think Bitcoin is meant to work for day-to-day -day payments. Rather, it is meant to be settlement layer. So 60 minutes to wait is awesome compared to a wire transfer if I can do it from a computer, like really easy, quick, and simple. It's not as cool if I want to buy coffee, right? But that's what Lightning Network is for. Or on Ethereum, well, Ethereum, first of all, only has like a 15 second block time. It's incredibly fast. It's awesome. Um, but even then there are, you know, I think Matic is, is more or less instant. I mean, there's, there's many side chains that are more or less instant, at which point, again, same game, right? Well, according uh, to Elon, that's what Dogecoin is for, so. Yeah, yeah, I... I, 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 you know, I, I I'm just kidding. Wrapped, I, I hope I, he was kidding, but I haven't quite wrapped my head around like, you know, Elon's attentions. My, and I'm a, I'm one of the biggest Elon fanboys. I, you, you know, I already followed him like back in 2012. Uh, Tesla was the first stock I ever bought. Um, but my perspective on him is that he suffers a little bit from nihilism because he, he's, he generally believes in simulation theory. So Elon has public knowledge that he, he thinks pretty much there's like a, 99.99% chance that this is a simulation, that this isn't real. And, you know, when you believe that none of this is real and you've already ascended to the highest echelon of the world, you, you at some point, where the richest man alive, you know, you're exploring others, you know, you're exploring space and everything. Um, a lot of this stuff seems a lot less meaningful, right? Because this is all a video game anyway, right? So I, I, I think if anything, his own nihilism, his own, like, he finds joy in that. So I, I, I don't think he takes it too serious, which can be communicated by the fact that Sp Tesla and SpaceX own Bitcoin. They do not own Dogecoin, right? So I would say, uh, look at what his companies are doing or what he's doing and less so on what he tweets because he's tweeted a lot over the years. Yeah, he's, he's, <laughs> he's a lot of fun. That's for sure. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you got to adore the man. Well, Felix, this has been a lot of fun as well. You are a wealth of knowledge. Um, I know everybody's going to get a lot of value out of this. Um, I will put your website link below so people can reach out. And uh, I hope we can um, do this again. Awesome. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank you for being here.